I'm going to be sharing this morning on the church part two, which is really important subject to be sharing, particularly because we're heading into Vision Sunday, which is next week. Next week's a really important time in the life of our church because it's an opportunity for us to say, you know, where we're going in the next 12 months. And this is a celebration year for us because it marks the 25th anniversary of our church. This church was planted 25 years ago, February 2000, February 1994. Uh, we planted this church, and so that marks. This month, 25 years, so we're going to be having a celebration this year. We're going to talk more about it next week. We're going to bring our chapel service and our west service into here. It's going to be jam-packed, and we'd love you to be here so that we can enjoy one another's company and hear the vision of the church for the next 12 months. And at night, we're going to have a baptismal service. So if you've not been baptised, please, please, please uh, register your commitment. Go to the Here to Help stand straight after service and uh, let us know that you want to be added to the amount of people that are being baptised next week and we're doing something really different we're going to have a barbecue we're going to have a shorter service and then we're going outside in our new land freshly landscaped area and do the baptisms outside you know assuming there's no blizzard or something that comes in assuming there's half decent weather that's what we're going to be doing so it's just going to be something different and something really really cool so we're going to enjoy doing that next week but today I want to talk about the church which is really appropriate because Jesus' sole vision was to build the church. We spoke a little bit about that last week. We looked at the, uh, the church and what it means to belong. That's what we looked at last week. And you can get that message on the podcast. This week, we want to look at what it means for the church to believe. And next week, we want to look at what it means for the church to behave. And I want you to note the order. Last week, we spoke about belonging. Today we want to speak about believing, and it's next week we want to speak about behaving. They're all three important subjects, but you've got to get the order right. You know, in this church, and I believe the universal church, according to the plan of God, that this is a place that you can belong before you believe. And that you can believe before you behave. This is important. It's not just important that we get the three things. We need to get the three things in the right order. You put this in the other order, and it becomes... Religion, real quick, it moves from Christianity to religion. See, religion says that you have to behave. You want to come to church? You've got to change the way you look. You've got to change the way you speak. You've got to change the way you act. And then, just then, you better change what you believe. And then if you do those two things, you might be able to join our elite club called the church. That's religion. And that is not what Jesus came to build. Jesus is not in the business of building religion. He's in the business of building a relationship. And so the Bible says, while we were still sinners, when you were sleeping around, when you were doing drugs, when you were swearing your head off, when you were gossiping, when you were slandering, when you were fighting and doing all those things, God came to us. And He befriended us. He became a friend to sinners. He says, we belong. Can we hang? And and in this church, we spoke about it last week, that this is a place that we can hang and you can belong. You, You might say, I'm not a Christian. I actually believe other things right now. And yeah, that's cool. You know what? This is the only thing I want you to know. You're welcome. If this is your first time and you believe in something else and you've got another religious background and that's cool, all I want you to know is you're welcome. You can belong and not even believe what we believe. You can get a coffee and you can have some interaction and you can get a smile and you can have some conversation today. You can belong. You can belong before you believe. And in uh, this incredible environment, we're going to talk today about what it means for the church to believe. Everyone say, believe. Believe. Last week, I referred to Matthew chapter 16, and today I want to read from it. Matthew chapter 16 is one of those passages that I've referred to probably as much as any other passage of Scripture over the last 25 years, because there's so much in it. And I want to read from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew was one of the 12 disciples who saw what Jesus did, who heard what Jesus said. He was coming to the end of his age. He thought, man, I better write this stuff down so that the people who are on planet Earth 2,000 years from now actually know what Jesus did and said. That That's what we're reading. We're reading a man's writings about what he saw and heard Jesus say and do. And so Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea... Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, when it comes to the church and what we believe, we need to know what believing is and we also need to know what believing is not. You see, when it comes to the church, our believing isn't in something It's in someone. This is a crucial point. When it comes to the church, believing isn't in something, it's in someone. Everyone say someone. See, Jesus asked Peter, he said, who do you say that I am? This is an interesting point because Christianity in its purest form is about a relationship with God. And this question that was asked of disciples is a question that will be asked of every person who ever walks this planet. You may be asked in church, you may be asked on the street, or you may be asked when you stand face to face with Jesus one day. But all of us will have to answer this question, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say that He is? Because Christianity is a story about a person and that person's name is Jesus. In other words, Christianity is about a relationship that's based on a person not a religion that's based on a list of rules. In other words, I'm just someone trying to tell somebody about a particular person and his name is Jesus. I'm a no one trying to tell everyone about someone. That's my mandate and that should be our mandate too, that we are no one trying to tell everyone about someone. In Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul, who's writing to a young man by the name of Timothy, says this. He says, That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I'm not ashamed because I know who I believe. And I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him to that day. Paul did not say, I know what I've believed. Paul didn't say, I know how much I've believed. Paul didn't say, I know when I believed. He said, I know who I believe. Christianity is about a person. Charles Spurgeon said this, I know the person into whose hand I have committed my present condition and my eternal destiny. I know who he is and I therefore without hesitation leave myself in his hands. It is the beginning of spiritual life to believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, faith can be summed up in two words. It's believing God. It's not believing in God. Do you know, even the devil believes in God. The devil's not an atheist. He believes in God. In James, it says that all the demons in hell believe in God and they shudder. They are terrified. The believing that we're talking about is more than just believing in. It's more than believing about God. You can believe about God. You can believe He's the creator of the world. You can believe He's omniscient. You can believe He's omnipresent. You can believe certain attributes about God. But that's not the believing we're talking about. We're talking about believing God. Faith is simply believing God. Some of you in this room, if not many of you in this room, may be aware of a man by the name of Charles Blondin, who was a, well, the world's greatest tightrope walker in the 19th century. And he decided one day that he was going to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And on June 30, 1859, 25,000 people gathered. Now you've got to understand, this is, this is in a time before television and all the things that compete for your time and attention today. 25,000 people gathered to watch this man possibly die as he walked 1,100 feet journey, 160 feet in the air from one side of Niagara Falls to the other. And he made it from one side to the other on the June the 30th that day. And it was greeted by incredible applause. After that day, he continued to do that journey many, many times. And because people get bored, he started doing different things. And, and so one particular day, he found himself in the middle of the rope where he cooked an omelette on the tightrope and ate it. 
which was greeted to much applause. But you know, these, 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 this group of people watching are a hungry group of people and so he had to keep trying to do different things. And, and on one occasion, he grabbed a wheelbarrow with 350 pounds of concrete in it and he walked from one side of Niagara Falls to the other, which again was greeted by a huge applause by the crowd that had gathered on the other side. Charles Blondin, on that particular day, eyeballed a certain man in the crowd. And he said, do you believe, key word, believe, do you believe I could walk my wheelbarrow from one side of Niagara Falls to the other with you sitting in it? And the man said, I believe you could do that. To which, with a smile on his face, Charles Blondin said to him, then get in and let's go. The man refused. <laughs> There's a difference between believing and really believing. Are you with me today? The point is this. It's one thing to believe that a man can walk from one side to the other by himself. It's another thing to believe that he could safely carry you across. But it's a whole nother thing to get in the wheelbarrow. And believing in Jesus is like getting into the wheelbarrow. It's entrusting all that you are to all that He is. I want you to get this. See, that man that was asked to get in the wheelbarrow wasn't putting his life and his hands into the wheelbarrow. He was putting his life and his hands into a man by the name of Charles Blondin. When you come to church, we are not putting our hands in the life of the church. We're putting our hands in the life of a man whose name is Jesus. The church just happens to be the wheelbarrow he's asking us to get in. But the moment we make church our saviour, the moment we make people our saviour is the moment we get into trouble. The church will let you down because it's full of people like me and like you. We're not to put our faith in the wheelbarrow. We're not to put our faith in the church. We're to put our faith in Jesus. And as we put our faith in Jesus, we know that He's got the church in His hands. Isn't it good to know that this church is not being propped up and held up by my strength and my hands and my wisdom. This church is being propped up by the everlasting arms of Jesus. We put our hands in our life into His hands. Not my hands. I will let you down. The person next to you will let you down. If you're looking to church to be your saviour, you'll be disappointed every time. But if we understand Christianity is about placing our hands in the hands of another. And His name is Jesus. See, it's not the amount of faith that matters. I want you to get this. It's the object of the faith that makes the difference. I'm going to say it again and I'm going to explain it because this is a game-changing thought. It's not the amount of faith that matters. It's the object of the faith which makes a difference. In other words, weak faith in a strong object is far greater than a strong faith in a weak object. The Bible says it this way, faith the size of a mustard seed can say to this mountain, be thou removed and it will be removed. Small faith in a big God is far greater than big faith in a little man. Every one of us has to face who we're going to give our life to. Are we going to keep control of our lives and be Lord and Master of our own life and have big faith in us? I, I don't need your help. I can do this myself. Big faith in yourself. The trouble is you're just a little man. You're just a little woman. I'm just a little man. But it's far better to have a little bit of faith in a big God. A little bit of faith in a big God can change your life. A little bit of faith that Jesus Christ died for you, rose for you and lived for you, intercedes for you and saves your soul from eternal damnation. You believe that, you will be saved. Which is far better than saying, I don't need that. I'm strong enough. I'm big enough. I'm good enough. I can save myself. Big faith in the wrong thing will lead to an eternal damnation and a loss of our lives. Is this making sense today? Yeah. See, it's not a matter how much you believe. It's more important in whom 
we believe. Having small faith in Jesus is far greater than big faith in yourself. So believing isn't in something, it's in someone. Secondly, believing isn't something you inherit, it's personal. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? The first emphasis of the question is, who do you say that I am? The bit I'm emphasising now is, who do you say that I am? Jesus was asking the disciples what they thought. You notice when Jesus said, who do they say? There was lots of banter. There was lots of talking. Isn't it amazing when we talk about what they say? How many times have you heard they say? Oh, they say. It's not just me, you know. They say, they say, they say. It's everyone, they. And what I've learned in life is they say, you know, a big they is about four people generally. <laughs> but, but they say. And everyone was talking when they say. It went really quiet when Jesus said, okay, that's enough. What about you? What do you say? Yeah. And it went really quiet. And under divine revelation, Peter speaks up. He says, I, I know who you are. You are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that was prophesied about. You're the one we've been believing for. You're the one who we've been waiting for. I know in whom I have believed. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, going through many trials, Paul was abandoned by all his friends, left for dead in a prison cell. And he says, you know what, Timothy, do not give up fighting the good fight. Do not give up now. He says, because I know in whom I have believed. He knew he knew, he had a personal revelation. Mary had an angelic visitation one night. An angel came and said, hey, you have found favour with the Lord. You're going to conceive a child. She said, how can that be? For I am a virgin. And I, I, just spare a thought for Mary. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know how you guys do it in heaven. I don't know how it all works in heaven. I don't know how the whole baby thing works in heaven, but here on earth... You need a guy and a girl and you need to get it on. And, and I've, I've not done that. I like a guy, but we haven't done it. I like him, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. And it's Sunday morning. It's too early for this, isn't it? It's Sunday morning. <laughs> but, but seriously, Mary's like, how can this be? And he says, because what's impossible for you is possible with God. Mary, do you believe? Yeah. And Mary said this, I believe. She didn't consult Joseph. I don't know what he thinks. I certainly don't know what the people are going to think. But you know what? I believe. And so essentially, Mary conceived, sorry, believed before she conceived. That, that's how it works. See, faith and belief is always personal. You can't believe for me and I can't believe for you. It's not how it works. I can't transfer my faith and what I believe onto you. I love my wife dearly, but I can't transfer my faith onto her. She needs her own revelation. And thank God at the age of 17, she came into a realisation that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life. And she surrendered her life to God on a particular day when she was 17 years of age in September. And she's been following Jesus based on a personal revelation. She's not saved because she's my wife. She's saved because she's had a personal encounter. We have three children and all of them profess faith in Christ. And they're not saved because they are my kids. They're not saved because they're the pastor's kids. They're saved because they've had a personal dynamic encounter with the living God and have chosen to give their lives to Him. And they've all been baptised and, and they are Christians and they have an assurance of their salvation. Why? Because of their personal faith in Christ. You can't live your life vicariously through the faith of another. And what I know, if you try to do that, you will get hurt. In the Bible, in the book of Acts, there's a man who had seven sons and they lived in a province called Sceva. And these seven boys were watching what Paul was doing and they were pretty enamoured with the incredible success that Paul was having in the name of Jesus. People were being raised from the dead. People that were sick were being healed and they thought, wow, this, this is pretty cool. Imagine us at our next party doing a trick like that. That'd be amazing. So they thought, we're going we're to try this thing that Paul's doing. And so they saw this guy who was demonised, who was under demonic oppression and uh, these seven lads 
gather around, I, you know, I, I see them gathering around this particular guy and, and they thought, what, did, what is it Paul that did? He? And, and, and maybe Paul had a coat of these threw on them. I, I don't know. Happens. But whatever it is, they were trying to mimic what Paul was doing and they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. In other words, they had no personal revelation of Jesus. It was a revelation that Paul had that they were trying to live vicariously through. And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of this man. And maybe they, maybe they spoke in tongues. Maybe they threw a coke on him. Maybe they, you know, I don't know. But what I do know is that this demonized man took offense to what was going on. Now, I don't know about you, seven against one, who would you say that is in favor, the odds are in favor of? Surely seven guys against one, you would imagine that the seven could handle themselves. But what we read in the story is that these seven lads got the hiding of their life. They got beaten up bad. And the weirdest part of the story for me is that it says they fled naked. I'm like, what sick pervert strips people naked? I mean, okay, beat them up, let them go. No, nah, I'm not finished with it. Imagine that bang, bang, bang. Hang on, I'm not finished. <laughs> like, what? Who would do that and why would they do it? And you know why? Because the devil wants to humiliate you. The devil wants to expose you. That's why that happened. You cannot live your faith through the faith of another. True believing is always personal and you must make your own mind up. The church at its heart is a community of believers that are joined together by their common faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why it's with good reason the Apostle Creed starts with, I believe. Not we believe, but I believe. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. I believe He was uh, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. I believe He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died and was buried. I believe He descended to the dead. I believe on the third day He rose again. I believe He ascended into the heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where He shall judge all the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Holy Universal Church. I believe in the communion of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins and I believe in the resurrection of the dead, of the body and of life everlasting. Amen, amen, amen. I believe that. I don't know about you, but I believe that. I believe that. And at the end of the day, it's what you believe that's gonna change your world or not. Jesus said, what do you say? What do you say? And based upon the revelation Peter had, it changed his life forever. Because you see, when we truly believe, it will change the way we live. When we truly believe, it will change the way we live. As I come into point three, can we have the keys come up? That'd be great. See, believing isn't something we say. It's something that we live. Believing is not just something we say. It's something we live. Because of this revelation that Peter had of Jesus, Jesus said, you know what? I I can use that. See, we need to understand one thing. When Jesus was asking this question, he wasn't having an identity crisis. It wasn't a moment where he's feeling the pressure of the people and having a whinge of the like, oh, they're saying bad things about me, and I, I just don't know who I am anymore. I don't know if I'm listening anymore. Oh, guys, I just need some affirmation. Who do you say that I am? I've forgotten who I am. I don't even know what I'm going on anymore. I thought I was a Messiah, now I'm not sure if I'm a Messiah. What do you think? It's not that. <laughs> Jesus, in full assurance of who he is, he says, Who do you say that I am? I know who I am. But who do you say that I am? Because Jesus knows for the church to be truly built, it can only build on a revelation of who He is. He says, you're the Christ. And I imagine Jesus looked at Peter and said, you know, I know you're impulsive. I know you've got some anger management issues to be dealt with, probably happen for the rest of your life. But you know what? I, I can work with that. 
See, Jesus isn't looking for perfection. He's looking for believing. He's looking for people that truly believe. He's looking for people that will get in the wheelbarrow and not just sit on the sidelines and talk. That's where the spectators are, on the sidelines, just talking. While the players are on the field, playing. Jesus is looking for believers. Not perfection. Peter blew it many times. Peter denied Jesus, not once, not twice, three times. Jesus pulled out a sword when Jesus was arrested, pulls out a sword and cuts off a servant's ear, which just means he was a bad shot. He wasn't going for the ear. He was going for the head. He just missed. And Jesus picks up the ear and figure, Peter. Because Jesus can use a believer that's impulsive, has a few issues. I, I thank God that in my teenage years, I had a God encounter. And there's much about the Godhead. There's much about eternity. There's much about heaven. There's much about life. I don't fully understand, but I know this to be true. Jesus Christ died for me because He is madly and passionately in love with me. And He called me to help build His church in Adelaide for such a time as this. And even when it gets tough and I feel like giving up and giving in and we all get to those moments, I go back to what He said. I go back to what I know to be true of my relationship with Him. This is the believing that we're talking about this morning. See, if we believe it, we will live it. What we live every day represents what we truly believe. If I said, who believes that if you exercise a little more and watch what you eat, you'll get in better shape? Most of us would say, I believe that. But I would say, you only truly believe it if you do it. It's not enough to say, I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. It, it's what we live. It's not standing on the sideline. It's not until we get into the wheelbarrow that it really becomes true believing. What we believe is about something is seen in the way we live. And what I, what I love about an account that's found in the book of Mark, chapter 9, was there was this man who had a demonised son and he brought his son to the disciples and there wasn't much luck of seeing his son set free. So he comes to Jesus and says, can you help my son? He says, what do you mean, can I? He goes, oh, Jesus, I believe. I do, but just help me with my unbelief. You see, how do we grow in our believing? You might say, I'm a believer, but if we're honest, our believing needs to grow. How, how do we grow in that? Well, we grow in it by humbling ourselves and asking Him to help us in areas that we're struggling with, areas that we're struggling to believe. This man was not put off by Jesus. Jesus didn't say, oh, stop wasting my time. What do you mean you don't believe? He said, bring me the boy. Pray for the boy. The boy was set free. God can do a lot with our humility. God can do a lot with our honesty. And we can go from believing to believing to believing. And we can grow in our understanding. We can grow in our belief. Because at the end of the day, you only really know what you believe when the pressure's on. Have you noticed that? When things are really tough, you find out what you really believe. But you know another time that really tests us? When things are going really good and there's no pressure on, that'll test what you really believe. And you know one other time that'll really test us? Everything in the middle when nothing's really happening. That'll test you. When it's tough, it'll test you. When it's good, it will test you. And when you're somewhere in the middle where nothing good or bad is really happening, it's just average, it'll test you. And if you can hold on and believe when it's tough. 2016, can you hold on? You know what? 2016, tough year, but I believe. 2017, brilliant year. Hey, hang on, let's get carried away. Let's remember who this is all about. I believe. 2018, honestly, this is an average year. It wasn't our best year, it wasn't our worst year, it's an average year. You know what? Let's just believe. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. 
So in the worst, let's believe. You get betrayed, you get abandoned, you get let down, someone walks out of your life, whatever the case may be, hang in there, because we believe. Everyone left Jesus, everyone left Paul. But I believe. You have a great year. Man, church, growth, 20%. Wow! Whoa, come on, let's settle down. It's not about us, it's him. Let's, let's remember in whom we believe. Let's not get carried away to success. Let's believe. Man, nothing happening. It's just boring. I don't know. Let's just believe. You think about the change of seasons. Imagine, imagine if a tree was like us. I'm losing my leaves. Oh, what's going on? Getting all this fruit in summer, green leaves, fruit. Hey, look at me. Mr. Fruitful. And then there's this middle bit, like autumn and spring. It's like nothing. It's like this got no leaves, I've got no fruit, I'm just nothing's really happening, it's feeling kind of awkward. That's us, it's, it's our lives. And in this room, some of you are in your winter season, some of you in summer season, some of you in autumn season, some of you in the spring season. And what holds you in those seasons is what you truly believe. Yeah? If you're in this place and you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've never truly believed, the good news is in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. Little faith in a big God can move you from one place to another. It says, For it is with our heart that we believe and are justified, and it's with our mouth that we profess your faith and are saved. The good news. 